I've got a super short presentation about my work in the further education sector on how to look at an intersectional uh, curriculum within the further education sector, which is adult education and ESOL is English to speakers of other languages. Uh -uh. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm even to my assistant. So my name is Laila Mitri. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm based in London in the UK. I work as an equity educator. Last year I was listed as um, the top 100 on the Pride Power list. I run two conferences, one of which is... Pride Education. Thank you very much. <laughs> Today and the other one is called Educating Art Racism, which is looking at race equity in education. I am also the founder of chair of um, the Proud London Councils, which is the LGBT Plus staff network in local authorities. We've got some people from the local authorities here today. Thank you so much for coming. And finally, I am the founder and co-chair of UK Queer Arabs, and I think my co-chair is here, Camille. Oh, I'm not sure, but are you with us? Oh, are you with us? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, there he is. Get, oh. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carmel, and I'm one of the co-chairs for UK Queer Arabs. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and we're marching up Pride! <laughs> So in this session, uh, I hope that by the end of it, you'll have a better understanding of what the further education sector is and how to embed LGBTIQ plus lives and issues within the curriculum. Also, I hope that you'll be able to understand what intersectionality is or, um, and how it relates to the ESOL sector. And I always finish with practical tips and resources. Thank you. So, what is the further education uh, context? It's post 16, so sixth form and adult education. And a lot of the courses are part-time, on-site and within the community, often under-resourced. Um, we are called the Cinderella sector in you know, further education, but it's massive. Just to give you an idea, one of the colleges that I worked in North London had 19,000 students part-time so the scale of embedding lgbtiq plus people when you've got people who come in after work or for two hours a week and you've got to go through the curriculum is not an easy task in terms of further education learners we call them the forgotten children of education even though they're not forgotten at all but when you look at the government funding in the united kingdom how much is allocated to HE, FE, primary and secondary? FE has got very little money compared to the other sectors. And the people who come to further education are from low socioeconomic backgrounds, um, people who dropped out of school, never got their GCSE and then um, their, their qualification. And then when they're older, they come and they go, oh, I want to get educated. And then in terms of the ESOL learners, English to speakers of other languages, they've got various level of education in their home background, um, in their home countries. Um, some of them are highly educated, they've got a PhD, and other people have never been to school. They don't even know how to read and write in their own language, let alone in English. So very mixed in terms of their background um, and their abilities. And some of them come from countries where we are, when I say we, the LGBTQIABCDEF, where we are criminalized or punishable by death. Um, so just to get an overview, this is from the Human Dignity Trust, um, 195 countries around the world, 71 countries uh, criminalize same sex, 11 death penalty that makes it really hard for me to go on holidays because what i do is i google lgbtq plus um rights and then add the name of the country whereas if you're straight you just go and choose your hotel where you're going to be and all that kind of stuff and definitely don't want to be sentenced to death can and in terms of europe 
it's really frightening what's happening in the UK today. So there's an organization called ILGA, ILGA, which is the International Lesbian Gay Association. Uh, and every year they do uh, a rights, human rights on LGBTI. So as you can see, this is where we were. Oh, I want to I want to use the technology and show off now. Uh, so um, this is where we were in 2015. We were at number one. And what position are we now this year? 14. 14. We've dropped down three spaces compared to last year. And there's and if you go to ILGA, you can see where your country is in Europe and also in all of the other countries. Now, why have we dropped? The government removed four million pounds from the education budget in March 2020, which was allocated to anti-homophobic bullying. The ban on conversion therapy excludes trans people. The immigration and policies for people seeking asylum is a joke, but that is not funny. Um, and the way trans and non-binary people are being represented in the press and media is really, really negative. As a result of this, we have gone from number one in 2015 in the UK to number... 14, please. Thank you, you're not sleeping. <laughs> so, let me remove this. I just wanted to experiment with this. This technology is just Wonderful. so brilliant. Yeah, I used to use interactive whiteboard in the classroom and this is like the next level. So, when we look at the people who come to our classrooms, they are refugees, people seeking asylum, migrants, people whose first language is not English. And when you think about a refugee, they have a triple trauma that they've experienced. The trauma in the home country, the trauma of migration, getting here, and then the settlement trauma. And the way the Home Office in the United Kingdom treats LGBTIQA plus people who are seeking refuge for being persecuted is frankly disgusting. They have to prove their sexuality. They have to, um, um, I, I, there's our horror stories. If you're really interested, I can um, share some resources after the conference and email you um, um, some stories, but they're heartbreaking. And no one leaves their home country to make a life worse for themselves. Whether you are a migrant, a refugee, you leave where you have come from because you want a better life. So all of these racist rhetoric that is happening at the moment in the press saying they come over here, take our benefit, I can guarantee you that is not the case. People are either working and if they're seeking asylum, they are living on five pounds a day until their, and their asylum claim can take forever. So this is the context. But when you look at the learner profile, and I'm using the wheel of power and privilege here, which some of you may be familiar with, you can see that if you're black and you have a low level of education and you're disabled and you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or you're significantly neurodiverse, or you are in the process of getting your citizenship or you're trans and non-binary, you don't speak English, and et cetera, and so forth and so on. You are marginalized and you are on the receiving end of multiple form of oppressions. So as a woman, I experienced rape, um, misogyny and sexism. As a lesbian, lesbophobia, yes, there is a word called lesbophobia. Homophobia is for the boys. Thank you very much. Um, and also as a woman of color, racism. So there's multiple form of oppressions that we are on the receiving end. But there's also loads of other things which are missing from the wheel. Accents, people judge you um, on your level of literacy, on your family situation, if you're a single parent, if you're old or young, you're being discriminated against, your religion, etc., and so forth and so on. And when we look at the... Um, population in further education, the learners, the thousands of learners who come, many of them are from these marginalized. So they've got a lot more support that is needed in order to help them achieve. I needed to contextualize this. Thank you, Cam. I needed to contextualize this 
because it's important to understand when people say, oh, we need to embed it into the education system. It's a lot easier to do in some settings than in others. Now, what is brought to the classroom is the lived experience that you have. And when you're black and you're trans and you're gay and you're disabled, the discrimination that you experience can be when you're traveling, when you're shopping, when you're doing sports and leisure, in the press and media, the representation, when you're looking for a job, when you're dealing with law enforcement, when you, if you have children, when you're dealing with your child school. So there's loads of different ways, but also people who are privileged experience the privileges in these areas of life. So when they come to the classroom, it's not just like I'm coming to learn, they're adults and they're bringing all of this baggage with them. So how to embed it? People said to me, oh, they don't have the language to do it. They can't do it. I was like, yes, you can. And you can do it at all levels. You can do it at lower levels. This is an example of categorizing application forms. Um, and within the forms, you have a look at sexual orientation, gender identities and expression, and it is mapped to the ESOL curriculum. Um, you teach them how to spell, you teach them how to complete the form, you teach them how to identify the categories. You can do it at intermediate level, looking at different pictures, describing different kinds of family. It's not just a mum and a dad, it's like a mum and a mum, a dad and a dad, but also we have an opportunity to develop inclusive language. So it could be a carer, um, um, responsible adult. Um, people are being brought, brought up, young people are being brought up by their grandparents or extended family. So there is an opportunity to embed inclusive language at every level. And at higher level, next slides, my fabulous assistant, there's loads more opportunities because as they develop language, then you can use real life materials because they've got enough English to be able to do it. So you could do films, conversation, debate, um, look at pronunciation, poetry, comedy, give them assignment research, look at current affair and news. But at the end of the day, it's about preparing them for work and progression onto higher education and universities. It's not a gay lesson. Yes, it is not a gay it's not about converting people to anybody. Both my parents were heterosexual and look how I turned out. <laughs> okay, it's about skills development and learner development. But for me, it's about learner empowerment because also, and also it has to be done as mentioned by um, Charlotte in your presentation holistically and you can involve external organization it can be integrated within arrangement activities and for me learner involvement is key nothing about us without us so in terms of external organization in London we just have our very very first LGBTQ plus museum queer Britain Yay. <laughs> You can also bring people to talk about their lived experience. Our next guest, Andrina Nian, is a guest and um, goes into schools and talks about her experience. Um, and it's about celebrating it intersectionally. So if you're doing Black History Month, bring us. If you're doing Refugee Week, which is this week, I believe, yeah. Refugee Week, yeah, look at the experience of LGBTIQA+. If you're doing Valentine's Day, Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Every and day, every day is Valentine's Day. And Valentine's Day yeah. is in February, LGBT History Month. Yay! In the UK. In the UK. Yeah, it's in Thank October you. in America. And there's a range of flights. And also, it's not just about June. I am a lesbian 365 days a year. Thank you very much. So I'm better. It's a lot of pressure on us activists in June to just deliver everything. And then we have like the spotlight and then they put us back in the closet. No, thank you. It was hard coming out in the first place. And finally, nothing about us without us. Class representatives, learner network. And if you go and visit the stall at lunchtime uh, and talk to just like us or any of the other organizations, 
they have practical tips on how to start your network and everything needs to be co-designed, co-delivered and co-produced involving people in the process. It's about shifting the power narrative. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. And same for the policies. Now, oh, language no. matters. I love my Angelou. People yeah. will forget what you said. They will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Words have power. So inclusive language is key. Now, I speak a few languages and I realize that it's not always easy to do it in French or Arabic or another language because the language is gendered. But we can say siblings rather than brother and sister. We can say partner rather than husband and wife, etc., and so forth and so on. And intersectionally means we need to avoid ableist language. I'm super organized. I'm not a little bit OCD, thank you very much. OCD is a recognized uh, diagnosed condition. And avoid making general statements. Older people are like this. No, as you get older, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so that may be X, Y, Z, and it may be. The environment matters. Think about the physical space as well as the virtual space. Have gender neutral toilets. I think they should just be called toilets, exactly, because if people know what sex you are in the toilets, there's something really wrong happening here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but also a lot of our further education colleges have got prayer and contemplation rooms. Having the progress flag in there is really important. Inclusive breastfeeding spaces. It's not just cisgender women who have children, etc., and so forth and so on. And a rainbow flag. I did a training session at the Refugee Council, and when I finished, they put a rainbow flag with the words welcome behind the reception in all the languages permanently. Wow. Not just yeah. not just to put it here and they it's like you're welcome throughout the year, not just in June, and then okay, let's take it down and then we'll come out again. So um, small signs have a big impact. These are some of the resources that I have written over the years. I was involved in the Rainbow Pilgrims, which is celebrating the rites and passages with Shan, who's on our next panel, um, Haringey Vanguard. There are loads of teaching and learning resources available now, which support people whose first language is not English. Communication matters. So if you're collecting data, make sure it's inclusive. If you're hiring, make sure that it's inclusive. Um, when you're communicating on social media, adding your pronouns to email signature and social media will also make a difference. Every step, every day from job advert to retirement. And for me, inclusion intersectionally is about being holistic and in Intentional, intentional from senior leadership, because having done it in so many different colleges, if I haven't got the backup of the principal or the vice principal, it yeah. backfires. And it's like being in a house without a roof. When it rains, you get very wet. I'm not going to make any more jokes on that. <laughs> so it's about being into, into intentional and holistic. And from the way, from the moment the student enters, from the moment they inquire about a course, support for staff and learners, and we've got the union here today, it's very important that staff feel supported, effective anti-bullying and harassment procedure for staff and learners, teacher training and access to inclusive resources, visibility and celebration, involve people in the process, have a forum to raise issues. Is your whistleblowing policy effective? If your manager is homophobic, biphobic, transphobic, and data, data is power. In the United Kingdom, we did the census in 2021. It, the results are coming out on the 28th of June. I am stalking the website like a hawk 
because for the very first time in the UK, they were asking about sexual orientation and gender identity. It needs to be every step of the way, including facilities and with a senior commitment from leadership and representation. Come. So it's an opportunity. It's a win-win, an opportunity to develop language, to develop skills, critical thinking skills, analytical skills. What's the difference between accept and agree? You don't have to agree that I'm a lesbian, but you have to accept. We have been here, we will always be here. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> About developing emotional literacy, emotion control, expressing feelings in a way that is not confrontational. Foster an environment which is conducive to language acquisition for all, and it's about preparing for real life beyond the classroom. And in the case of refugees, migrants, and people seeking asylum, understanding the host country culture, because we are very lucky in the United Kingdom that we can be our authentic selves. There are still things that we need to do, but I'm not gonna end up in prison, or I'm not gonna be sentenced to death, Just for being who I am. And obviously, if you're being inspected by Ofsted, it's a win-win, because if you can demonstrate that you're inclusive, you get brownie points. At the end of the day, it's about people at the heart of everything we do and working in a way that is trauma-informed. And after the pandemic, we have seen the detrimental effect it had on our community. So it's not just refugees who have experienced trauma. I think we've all been traumatized by that. It's about being bias aware because of their culture or their uh, religion. But for me, it's about compassion. It's about kindness. Your mate is being discriminated. What are you going to do? Support them. Stick up for them. Thank you. Exactly. You're going to stick up for them. So it's about being kind. Voila, thank you very much. Hey. Woo!